starts right now. It is a death that's raising a lot of questions. Was this man killed? His family believes he was. But San Antonio police have not yet made a determination. Family members identify him as Jesus Solis. He was found shot in the head in his pickup truck yesterday. He later died at the hospital. The night team's Jaffney Gray with how his family is remembering him. He was an honest man, a good man. Family members of Jesus Solis, or Jesse, are still in shock after learning the 47-year-old was found with a gunshot wound inside his parked pickup. He was parked at the back of a construction site where he worked near Eisenhower on the northeast side. It just seemed grim, to be honest. His loved ones say the details surrounding Solis' death were unexpected. I just got the call saying that something happened to my uncle and that he was being rushed in an ambulance. I almost wrecked. <laughs> thinking that something had happened to my, my brother, you know, construction work wise. Solis would have turned 48 this Thursday. I've put that far from my mind because I know that the emotions that will come up if I even start thinking about that. They say Solis was a hardworking man who loved his job and was always early for work. He had a routine to get there to work early because he wanted to beat traffic. They described him as a creature of habit with a larger than life personality. Very old fashioned, did not believe in social media, had a flip phone. He was loud, very loud. I know I would be asleep <laughs> at the house, and if I heard that voice, it's going to wake me up. Most of all, they say his heart was made of gold. He was a very kind, sweet person, very giving. Irreplaceable. Irreplaceable. San Antonio police say they're waiting for the medical examiner's ruling on whether Solis' death was a homicide or suicide. However, his family is certain that somebody is responsible. Us as a, fam as a family would love to have that closure to see that person, to face that person and ask them why. Now again, San Antonio police are asking anyone with any information that can help in this case to call their homicide unit. That number is 210-207-7635. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. A murder-suicide involving workplace violence on the east side. Tonight, the medical examiner identifying both men who died in the case. Police also confirming that 56-year-old Baldemar Martinez Tamez is the accused gunman in the case, and 47-year-old Jamie Martinez is the victim. According to a police report, both relatives worked at JTM Transport on I-10 and Foster Road on the northeast side. Police say Martinez shot just after 11 this morning. The suspect later found at a family dollar about five miles away with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. A kitchen fire leads to evacuations at a northwest side strip mall. The fire happened at Crown Point Center off Culebra Road. The San Antonio Fire Department says someone living in the apartments behind the strip mall first saw the smoke coming from the building. That person called 911 and when crews arrived on scene, smoke could be seen billowing out of the roof. Everyone at the shopping center was evacuated. Fortunately, no one was injured. Firefighters plan to return to the property tomorrow to determine what started the fire in the kitchen. Unfortunately, people around them start to see that they are forgetting things, that grandma will sign her check and forget 20 minutes later, and they take advantage of that. And it's, it's, it's horrible. Unthinkable financial crimes against seniors. It's happening. Criminals have been getting away with it for years. Bear County Judge Veronica Vasquez, who you just heard from, says a newly formed task force will aim to make sure those involved are prosecuted. The 19th's Patty Santos tells us they are trying to close cracks in a system at every level. If you hear the things that I hear in my courtroom, you can't help what, but want to do something about it. So it's incredibly frustrating when you feel like on the other end, nothing is happening. Bear County probate judge Veronica Vasquez is making it her mission to change the current status quo. Almost daily, she rolls on cases involving people over 65 years old who are being financially exploited, but no one seems to be sure what happens to the suspects. What I was seeing a lot of times in this courtroom is that those perpetrators were being validated on, but they weren't being prosecuted. 
Last year, 130 exploitation abuse cases were investigated and confirmed by Adult Protective Services, or APS. APS doesn't prosecute cases, it only investigates them and refers them to law enforcement. Vavasquez and State Senator Jose Menendez found that it's hard to track how many, if any, are being criminally prosecuted. Well, it's disappointing, shocking and disappointing, uh, that they're not prosecuted, uh, whether it be a lack of resources, whether it be a lack of evidence. Last fall, Vasquez had along with State Senator Jose Menendez, launched the Elder Abuse and Exploitation Task Force. The whole point of this task force is to say everyone that has a stake in this game needs to take responsibility because we need to do something. They discovered that somewhere between APS, law enforcement, and the district attorney's office, the cases were falling through the cracks. So now, once a month, a representative from those agencies, along with banks and the attorney general's office, meet up to set up a line of communication and track these financial crimes against seniors. I think that we need to send a strong message that says, you are, no one should prey on our senior citizens, and if you do, you're gonna be prosecuted. And one of their missions is to educate the public about where to call if they suspect financial crimes against a senior. They want to erase the stigma in the community that nothing will be done about it. The 24-hour hotline to report a crime to Adult Protective Services is 800-252-5400. Thank you, Patty. He's been on the run for almost two years, and tonight authorities need your help tracking him down. James Brandyburg is wanted for not telling law enforcement where he lives. He's required to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life after he was convicted of sexual assault in 2007. The Lone Star Fugitive Task Force has been searching for Brandyburg since May 2018. If you know anything that can lead to his arrest, call the Lone Star Fugitive Task Force at 210-657-8500. Six students forcing one school to close temporarily. The cases led to low attendance at Ingram Elementary School. The school sits northwest of San Antonio, not all that far from Kerrville. School staff says Ingram Elementary closed its doors today and will remain closed tomorrow as crews go through the facilities to clean thoroughly. We asked if the flu was to blame, but the school only described this being in response to incidents of illness. They wouldn't specify which one. The students are set to return to Ingram Elementary on Thursday. We're told students won't have to make up the two days that they missed. One San Antonio school district changing course, Northeast ISD is dropping class rankings for all students who are not within the top 10% of their class. It's the first district in San Antonio to make the move, and it's a plan that's been in the works since 2018. Donna Newman with NEISD says this will help alleviate stress that students feel about their class rank. She says district officials met with school administrators, counselors, parents, and universities. Usually the top 10% are automatically admitted at most state-funded universities in Texas. NEISD says they found during the admission process that some universities are actually looking at the child's entire academic experience, not just their class rank. Newman says this process is starting with the district's seventh graders who are just now choosing their eighth grade courses. New developments after the loss of a Floresville councilman. We have now learned his daughter was appointed to fill his seat. Jared, Ed, Jared Jimenez was killed last week in a two vehicle accident in Wilson County. Now his daughter, Jade Jimenez, will serve in the place for seat. Another councilwoman, Marisa Jimenez, who is of no relation, released pictures of Jade's swearing in ceremony. She also said the appointment was made after a unanimous vote. On her Facebook page, she went on to say, quote, as titles are meant to be passed down, records meant to be broken, I am no longer the youngest Hispanic female. I have passed that title to Miss Jade, and let me tell you, I am so proud to do so, end quote. We've got a night beat update now on those Taco Cabana closures here in town. The parent company for the taco chain now amending information they gave us last night. They now say only one location closing in San Antonio. The other closure is in New Braunfels. The location on Highway 90 actually remains open, but the location on Blanco Road and West Avenue remains closed. Taco Cabana's parent company, the Fiesta Restaurant Group, is now reporting the New Braunfels location on State Highway 46 is closed. This in addition to the more than a dozen other locations closed throughout the state. 
because of what the company calls significant loss in revenue. The Fiesta Restaurant Group, also the parent company for the Pollo Tropical restaurants. Back in 2017, you may remember that the company closed more than two dozens of those locations, including those here in San Antonio. At the time, the company blamed the effects of Hurricane Harvey for the limited awareness of that brand. Good evening. Patchy dense fog is beginning to develop across portions of South Texas here in San Antonio. Visibility is still OK. We're at eight miles, but up in the hill country, Kerrville, you're down to one quarter of a mile visibility right now. So the fog will continue to settle in through the overnight hours and as everyone is getting out the door tomorrow morning. So yes, another kind of messy morning commute, overcast fog, mist drizzle. 10% chance that there will be some rain a little bit heavier than drizzle out there tomorrow morning and temperatures are not going to be much cooler than they are right now. We're looking at a low overnight in San Antonio right around 66 degrees and we're at 67 right now. We'll take a look at what the rest of your Wednesday has in store and when we could see rain chances ramp up just a little bit coming up in a few minutes. Steve. Thank you, Katie. Still ahead on the night beat. Selena forever. The sneak peek into this new exhibit that's now calling the McNay Art Museum home. And we're heading to the debate stage in Iowa where the presidential candidates laid it all out. The candidates responding to the elephant in the room coming up. And a school shooting hits Houston. Investigators providing an update in this case next on the night beat. Another school shooting hits Texas about three and a half hours after today's school shooting at a Houston high school. An arrest is now made. We still don't know if the suspect was a student and what led up to tonight's arrest. Today's shooting claimed the life of a 16 year old student at Bel Air High School, but it is unclear if the shooting happened inside or outside the building. The Houston Independent School District says cl classes will be canceled tomorrow. It is caucus crunch time tonight in Iowa. The seventh Democratic presidential debate had high stakes. Twelve candidates still in the race, but tonight only six made it to the debate stage at Drake University. The elephant in the room tonight reports that Senator Bernie Sanders told Senator Elizabeth Warren in December of 2018 that a woman couldn't win a presidential election. Well, as a matter of fact, I didn't say it. Anybody knows me knows that it's incomprehensible that I would think that a woman could not be president of the United States. Bernie is my friend, and I am not here to try to fight with Bernie. The only people on this stage who have won every single election that they've been in are the women, Amy so and me. And in the midst of looming tensions between the United States and Iran, the candidates spending an extensive amount of time on foreign policy, the Iowa caucus now less than three weeks away. The first of the state to vote, first of the states to vote. The latest Des Moines Register poll had Senator Sanders at the top, but it's a virtual four way race with Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren and Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Well, the 2020 census is just a few months away, but before it begins, we wanted to help answer any questions our viewers had over the process, like what is the census, what questions are asked, and how you can complete it. We are outlining the census on our website right now. You can find it by going to ksat.com slash SAQ. And tomorrow morning, we're live streaming another question and answer session on ksat.com over our new Defender series, Broken Blue. It aired Sunday night, but you can watch it right now online at ksat.com. And the question and answer session takes place also online tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Siempre Selena. Tonight, a sneak peek at the exhibit for the Tejano music legend set to open at the McNay Art Museum tomorrow. The series of photographs were taken by award winning San Antonio photographer John Dyer. He photographed the singer for the cover of Moss Magazine in 1992 and for Texas Monthly. And you see two sides of Selena, an emerging artist in her late teens, early 20s for the first half of the show, and then the second in her final moments. In fact, when she was photographed in those final months in 1994 for Texas Monthly, it was only a few months later that she would meet her untimely death. And there's a lot of vulnerability in the second half of the exhibition. The exhibit will run from tomorrow to July 15th. Very interesting idea for an mm -hmm. exhibit. Yeah. I think I'll have to go out there and Absolutely. take that one Beautiful. in. Beautiful. All right, 67 degrees outside.
warm and muggy. Oh yeah. yeah. Not how you usually describe a January day. No, and it's going to continue. I mean, our high today, 77. That was two degrees shy of the record high for today. And our average high this time of year is in the low 60s. So we, if you were like, feels like spring, you were right. It was way warmer than average today. I expect we're going to do it all over again tomorrow. That does include the morning fog, but tomorrow afternoon should be another very warm winter day for us here in South Texas. You notice temperatures take about a 10 degree dive on Thursday. There's going to be a cool front that stalls out just north of San Antonio and becomes stationary. That's what this frontal boundary here means, but we should get some cooler air to filter in to cool us down a little bit on Thursday. We climb back into the 70s on Friday. That'll be short lived though. Cool front comes all the way through San Antonio late Friday, early Saturday to cool us down for the weekend. Sneak peek though of the Martin Luther King Jr. Day holiday next week. 50 for the high temperature. It looks like it's going to be uh, a chilly holiday weekend for us here, and we'll talk all about that coming up. Right now, we've got upper 50s in the Hill Country, 68 here in San Antonio, 70 down in Pleasanton. We switch over to our dew points, and there's not a huge spread between our air temperatures and our dew points now, and that's why some fog has begun to develop. Only a three degree spread really between our dew point and our air temperature here in San Antonio. We've got a three quarter mile visibility up in Kerrville. That's up a little bit from just a few minutes ago. Six miles here in San Antonio. That's down from when we uh, checked visibility a few minutes ago. Five miles in College Station there, seven miles in Hondo. So fog will continue to roll in through the overnight hours and just like the past couple of mornings, it'll be there to greet you when you head out the door in the morning. And some of this fog could be dense. I wouldn't be surprised if we have yet another dense fog advisory come out in the overnight hours or very early tomorrow morning. So another kind of messy commute for you. Some mist drizzle, a few sprinkles possible very early on tomorrow. But just like today, I expect we'll see some sun in the afternoon that will help to warm us up once again. High temperatures, upper 70s. And then late tomorrow evening, like what we're seeing take shape now, skies become cloudy again and even the chance for some fog to redevelop late tomorrow evening. Rain chances tomorrow will be slim, just a 10% chance of a stray shower. But look what happens as we get into Thursday. And Friday, finally, after a few days of just really light uh, kind of nuisance rain, we'll get a better chance at some measurable rainfall, maybe even some thunderstorms as we get into Thursday and Friday. So I do want to take you through the next few days and show you what we're expecting here on future cast. So tomorrow, uh, another pretty quiet day as we get into Thursday morning, that front I mentioned that's going to come in and stall out or become stationary uh, that will be working through the hill country very early on Thursday. We've been watching forecast model runs very closely. I even adjust the forecast since the 6 p.m. newscast this evening to make things a little bit cooler as we get into Thursday afternoon. This frontal boundary sags uh, south toward the Highway 90 corridor. 50s up in the Hill Country Thursday afternoon. I'm going to go upper 60s here in San Antonio. 70s well to the south of town. So a big spread in temperatures coming on Thursday. Some showers in the forecast Thursday as well. We'll hold on to a chance of rain Friday. I actually think Friday could end up being our best chance of rain between the two days as the cool front that's going to clear everything out for us for the weekend is approaching from the northwest. So a 60% chance of scattered showers. We may even increase that chance of rain for you on Friday uh, if forecast models continue to trend the way they have been. Here's a look at how the potential rainfall totals will play out. Totals do look higher west of the I-35 corridor. This is taking into account tomorrow all the way through Saturday afternoon when rain chances will drop out of the forecast for everyone. But some folks west of 35 could see close to an inch of rain, and that would definitely, definitely help out. So we're going to go on a ride temperature-wise. 70s the next few days. We really cool down this weekend, and the holiday on Monday looks like it could be pretty chilly. Bring so the jacket. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Katie. Mm -hmm. All right. A former cowboy assistant finds a new job. Already, and he's very valued at this position. When we come back, Rod Marinelli has found work. Where is that in the NFL? And you don't see this very often anymore, but how about a victory cigar? <laughs> coming up. A little red hour box. Exactly. You don't see this much anymore, but a victory cigar following LSU's perfect end to a perfect season in big board sports. But first.
Texas. San Antonio Spurs don't face the Heat in Miami until tomorrow to wrap up their four-game, eight-day road trip, but they will also get to host the Heat in San Antonio this coming Sunday. It is during that game the Spurs will host Indigenous Night, initiated by the Spurs guard Patty Bills, an advocate for Indigenous people and cultures all over the world, including his own home country of Australia, which is struggling right now to control the massive wildfires. In an effort to bring light to Indigenous cultures throughout the world, Mills has connected with the descendants of San Antonio's earliest settlers, the Tape Palam Kohitikan Nation, to also create an apparel collection that features imagery depicting the tribe's early history. And the first 10,000 in attendance will receive Patty Mills' bobblehead, in which Mills is depicted holding his ancestral flag. Those are the Torres Strait Islanders and Australian Aboriginals. Remember, that game is early on Sunday at 2 p.m. Next up for the Spurs, though, first is the Heat in Miami tomorrow at 6.30. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Former Cowboys defensive coordinator Rod Marinelli has landed on his feet as a new defensive line coach for the Oakland Raiders. Now they will be the Las Vegas Raiders this coming season. Marinelli, who is now 70 years old, spent the last seven years with the Cowboys, six as their defensive coordinator, who will reunite with head coach John Gruden from the successful days in Tampa Bay. Also, Cowboys linebacker Leighton Vander Ash had surgery on his neck today after missing the better part of eight games, including the last six games with the injury to his neck. He's expected to make a full recovery and participate in all off-season programs. What happens now in Houston when it comes to the Texans after blowing a 24-point lead on the road against the Chiefs in Kansas City to be eliminated in the AFC Division round again? The call that started the comeback was, of course, the fake punt in the second quarter that was snuffed out by the Chiefs' defense. And Kansas City then would go on to score the Texans, outscore the Texans 51-7 in the 51-31 postseason defeat. Many feel what should happen is that Bill O'Brien has to go. It's been his team in his total control since the firing of general manager Brian Gain last June. The Texans have fallen short of the AFC title game again, but Texan insiders feel that McNairs will not fire O'Brien. And when questioned whether or not he believes the Texans will hire a new GM this offseason, this is O'Brien's response. I feel like where we are right now, um, the way that I see it right now, it stays the way it is. And we have, a, we have uh, again, a great group of people um, that meet daily, um, that, uh, you know, talk about the team, the roster, all the all the support staff, you know, the sub programs that we have here and try to make the best decisions for the team. All right. If the McNairs don't hire a new general manager, then the 2020 team will be O'Brien's from start to finish. Two of the top high school soccer programs in the nation facing off tonight right here in San Antonio. Next. The next stop for Joe Burrow will be the NFL draft, more than likely the number one overall pick by the Cincinnati Bengals. But forgive Joe if he enjoys the moment. After all, how many players there can celebrate a Heisman Trophy season by winning a national championship, capping off a perfect 15-0 season? That's exactly what the LSU Tigers did last night in New Orleans and knocking out the defending national champion Clemson Tigers. LSU was actually down 17-7 when Burrow started to heat up and then look out. He threw five touchdowns, including two to Jamar Chase, who had 221 yards receiving before the night was out. That's a new college football national championship record as well. Burrow also ran for another TD for a total of six on the night. But when it was all said and done, Joe Burrow became the first college football player in a major program to throw 60 touchdowns in a season in the 42-25 victory. There's been so many people that have come into this from people that have helped me along my journey from Ohio, Louisiana, everywhere. And we couldn't have done it with a better group of guys. Not, not just football players, but great, great men that I just feel blessed to, to be a part of this. Now, with a victory, LSU ended Clemson's unbelievable 29-game win streak. And after the loss, Dabo Sweeney was gracious in defeat. I thought LSU played a beautiful game. Um, I thought their quarterback was tremendous. Those receivers, they made some incredible plays that were uh, really well covered, uh, several of them. And, uh, you know, but, but they just made the play. And that's what you got to do to win these type of games. So you give them credit. I thought they played a heck of a game and deserved to win the game. The Wagner Thunderbirds on the road tonight against the Indians at Harlandale High School with the Thunderbirds ranked at the top of the high school basketball standings. Journey Phillips watched the Euro step for the basket and the foul. But after that, Harlandale is able to counter Saxon Langenberg down the baseline for a layup. But watch this. The T-Birds were just too powerful in the second half, scoring 50 big points. This one goes around the horn to Braylon Seals, and Wagner improves to 21-5 in the 81-35 victory. 
Check this out. Packed house at Bob Benson Stadium at Central Catholic High School tonight. And the reason two of the top soccer teams in the nation met for a showdown in number one Lee against number 19 Central Catholic. Scoreless draw until the 10th minute when the Volunteers' Wilmar Aguilar will some fancy footwork is able to sneak in past the goalie just inside the pole to give Lee the one to nothing lead. And that will be the, how the showdown ends. One nil Lee. You know, that's right across the street when I was leaving for dinner. I was like, I thought football season was, was over. over. No, a packed house yeah, for that. It was. Thank Thanks. you, Greg, and happy birthday. Thank you. We'll be right back. A lot going on in the forecast, so make sure you have the weather app downloaded and updated to get the latest updates. All right. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. so for the night, be GMSA at 430. Good night.